Okay, so I think it's uh, time to start. Um, good morning. Um, so let me br briefly um, recap uh, what I what I did to yesterday. Um, and so essentially, the the, the thing that um, that you should remember is that we introduced uh, this notion of fitness landscapes, and essentially, for our purposes, these fitness landscapes are functions on the hypercube. And I denote the fitness by f and the, the uh, genotype by tau. Um, and the hypercube has a dimension, which is the length of the se sequence L. Which is essentially the set 0, 1 raised to the power L. Um, and uh, I, I showed you two representations of, su of such fitness landscapes. Um, so it's such a function can be represented in different ways. So one was a kind of power series in, in, uh, in different orders of products of taus, and these are uh, uh, known as, as epistatic interactions of different orders. So there's an expansion in epistatic interactions. of different orders. And this is philosophically essentially a kind of Taylor expansion, right? So you, 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 you define your, your mutations with respect to some reference genotype, which is like the origin around which you expand, and then you write things as deviations from that, um, from that point. So this is a kind of Taylor expansion, and it has actually this term has also been used in this context. So. And the other representation that I showed you was in terms of these fitness graphs. So the fitness graph means that you indicate um, so if this is our hypercube for three dimensions, we put arrows on the edges, and the arrows always point towards increasing fitness. Right. And for reasons that we discussed, you have to do this in such a way that there are no cycles in this graph. <clears throat> now, of course, this, this fitness graph doesn't contain the whole information about the fitness landscape. This was also something that some of you asked yesterday. Um, so it, it, what it does, it, it encodes, mathematically speaking, it encodes a partial order uh, on, these, on these fitness values. That is, by looking at the fitness graph, you can tell uh, which of two fitness values is greater if they are adjacent on the cube, right? So it's a kind of partial order of fitness values. But for example, you cannot, if, um, But for example, if you have two different fitness peaks, so peaks are distinguished by the fact that they are sinks for the arrows, right? So you have arrows coming in to a point. If, if all arrows are in, in, inward pointing at a vertex, then this is a maximum. But if you compare two different maxima by looking at the fitness graph, you cannot tell which of them has a higher fitness. Okay, so this contains a kind of partial information, but it's, but it's, a, but it's a very important information because it tells you essentially which pathways are possible if you want to evolve on such a landscape and if you, you are constrained to move uphill, okay? And that's sort of the, the, the main uh, uh, topic I want to discuss today. So um, this is the next section, uh, which will be about uh, accessibility of such landscape. So I call this landscape topography. and accessibility. 
And so, so before you know, making this more formal, let me, let me just give some motivation. Um, I'll come back to this in more detail tomorrow. Um, but let me just remind you of the, the result of the first two lectures, which was uh, this expression for the fixation prob probability. And I'm going to write down the version that is known as the Kimura formula, and I'm, I'm going to look at um, the uh, case where there's a single mutant, okay? So there's a single type A individual in a, in a C of, of B individuals. And then the, the expression that we found, uh, or that, that follows from diffusion theory, is this one, right? So we have the population size here. And essentially, what, what this tells us, and this is, again, I will elaborate on that uh, uh, tomorrow, if the population size is large, so if n is large, more precisely what I want to, want to uh, um, assume is that n times s absolute value is large compared to 1. So s can be negative or positive. But if this is the case, then what you can see from this formula, if s is negative, then this exponential down here will become extremely large and the whole thing will just go to zero. So this is zero if S is negative. And if it's positive, then we can ignore this term and we will get e to one minus e to the minus two S when S is positive. And so, so that tells us that populations for this, which this is true, and this is a fairly, uh, uh, not a very difficult condition to fulfill because as I said, selection coefficients are of the order of a few percent. But of course, populations that we're interested in in microbial experiments, for example, are, are much bigger. So this will generally be true. And so if this is true, it means that essentially uh, a mutant that appears in a population uh, can fix only if it's beneficial. Okay, that's, that's sort of the main thing. So which means in the context of the fitness landscape, if, I'm sort of, if my population is sitting at some point in the fitness landscape, a mutation appears. If it lowers fitness, I can ignore it because it will go extinct anyway. If it increases fitness, it has a certain chance of moving to that new state, right? So this is sort of the main point. So, um, so large populations are constrained to move uphill in fitness. Okay, so that's sort of what I'm, what I'm going to assume throughout today, that, that if I look at such a fitness graph, then the path that I can take are those where fitness increases uh, um, Every, in every step, okay? And so guided by the, this idea, we can define certain features that are sort of relevant for this, for this process. And so I'm going to define a, a couple of things. So the first definition is what is a peak? This is fairly obvious, a local maximum. Um, so a genotype, oops. Tau is a local fitness maximum. So sometimes we'll just call this a peak. And so what is the condition? The condition is that um, the fitness tau, f of tau is greater than the fitness of all its neighbors. So this means f of tau is greater than f of tau prime for all tau prime which are at distance one, right? So these are the neighbors are those which have Hamming distance one to this um, genotype. I should say uh, throughout I'm assuming that there are no degeneracies. So I'm assuming that this landscape at least for neighboring genotypes, the fitness values are never the same. Uh, this is something one can discuss, but, but um, 
you know, if you look at if you look at at the whole thing with sufficient resolution, this will do, this will generally be true. Okay, so there are no so assume. Um, There are no degeneracies in the fitness landscapes. Okay, so this is a peak, and you know, in the example that I drew, there is a peak here. All right, so this would be a peak because all the arrows are coming in. Okay. And a peak under this assumption, a peak is of course a genotype from which you cannot get away, right? So, so these peaks are sort of traps for, for evolution, if you will. And this is sort of what, what uh, uh, Wright was concerned about in this uh, uh, text that I quoted yesterday, that you know, evolving populations would tend to be uh, 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 stuck at such peaks. Okay, so these are the peaks. The second definition um, concerns pathway. So first we have to say what is a pathway. Um, so a mutational pathway or path. I think I can just call it path. That's maybe you know shorter and um, is. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's sort of what you would think. It's, it's a sequence of steps when each step you move uh, by one mutational distance um, is a sequence of adjacent genotypes. Okay, so we start at some genotype tau zero, and then we go to a genotype tau one, genotype tau two, and so on. And the whole thing has maybe a length n. And adjacent means that every pair of, of uh, genotypes along this path are at distance one, right? So um, the distance between tau i and tau, tau i plus one is equal to one. Okay. <clears throat> and so, as I said, because of this assumption that fitness only increases along a path, um, a specific subset of paths are particularly important, namely those which are um, <clears throat> uphill and those we will call accessible. The path is called accessible. Um, if fitness increases monotonically, along the path, And so this means that, you know, that these fitness values along the path are ordered. So f of tau 1 <clears throat> is smaller than f of tau 2, and so on up to f of tau, tau n. <clears throat> so these are the paths that will be particularly interesting. And the final uh, distinction that we have to make is uh, between direct and um, indirect path, or sometimes one says directed. I want to avoid directed because the, the, the hypercube is, of course, is a directed graph thanks to these arrows, but of course a path doesn't have, in general, doesn't have to follow the arrows. So, um, of course, a accessible path follow the arrows. So let me, so, so what does it mean to be direct? So a path is direct. So essentially a path is direct if it's the shortest, if it has a minimal length that it can have, which means that in short, um, if the, the Hamming distance between the initial and the end point is exactly equal to the number of steps, okay? 
So if n, which is the length of the path, is equal to, so this is the length of the path, um, <coughs> is equal to the distance between the initial and the final point. So I just see here, I, I started here with zero. So here, of course, I should also start with zero, right, to be consistent. So in fact, um, yes. <clears throat> um, and so this means that every step, so you have essentially, for a, in general, for a path, you have an initial point and a final point. And if every, every step along the path takes you closer to the final point, then the path is direct, right? But that doesn't have to be the case. So give me, give me, let me give you an example of these different definitions. Um, and again, we'll do the three-dimensional cube. Um, so after these lectures, you'll all be very good at drawing cubes. Okay, so this is our cube. And so let me put uh, a couple of arrows here. Um, Okay, so we have a couple of peaks here. This is, for example, a peak, right? Because the, all the arrows are coming in. Um, this is another peak. And uh, now we could, so for example, one example of an accessible path <coughs> And let's say this is our starting point, okay? So let's say we look at paths that start here. So this is tau zero. Then for example, I could get to this peak by going here and here. This would be a direct path, right? Because uh, I have two steps and the distance between the two is, is, uh, is two. So this would be an example of a direct path. Of course, I could also take a direct path to this peak, which just has one step, but I can also take an indirect path. And so um, an indirect path to this peak would be this one, right? So I go up here, and then I go here, and then I go back, right? So this would be a path of length three, which covers um, uh, distance one. Okay, so this is an indirect accessible path. And so, you know, if you, for example, if, if for, for concreteness, if we assume that this initial genotype is zero, 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 then along a direct path, you would keep on increasing the number of one, so you add one, one after the other, whereas this indirect path involves what is called a mutational reversion, right? So, so here you, 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 uh, you, you change uh, one side from zero to one, and here you change it back. And I showed you yesterday this example of this antibiotic resistance landscape with, with reversions. And you would, of course, expect, and we'll discuss it in more detail later, that if you allow for reversions, it should somehow be easier to get around in the landscape, right? So that's, that's sort of... Um, you know, you can, it, it, it might help to take detours. I'm, I'm sure the same is true when you're driving in Bangalore, that sometimes it's better not to try to take the shortest route. Um, okay, so this is, these are the, the, the quantities um, that we want to uh, look at today. Um, and uh, um, let me, and so, so uh, these are sort of useful measures also because they are related to this concept of sine epistasis. So I explained to you yesterday um, the concept of sine epistasis, which means in terms of this, this fitness graph that there are um, arrows at parallel 
um, uh, links which have different directions. And so what, uh, what uh, Dan Weinreich and collaborators showed uh, in their paper where they introduced this concept was that um, the presence of sign epistates is sort of intimately related uh, to these um, uh, measures. And so there are a couple of uh, sort of theorems that one can prove about this, um, which I will just state and leave it for an exercise to prove. So the following statements are true. So this is an exercise. So the first one is that um, if there is no sign epistasis, then the landscape has a unique maximum. So a fitness landscape um, without sine epistasis has a unique maximum. This is easy to prove and it just, you know, it, it's sort of helpful to get, get a grasp of these, of these concepts. Now the converse is not true. And in fact, uh, finding a, a, a local condition that guarantees that you will have more than one maximum is not, not uh, trivial, so no, nothing very simple has been found. But what one can say is that a necessary condition for having t uh, more than one maximum is that there should be reciprocal sign epistasis. So you remember reciprocal sign epistasis, I'll, I'll draw a picture about that in a moment. Let me just put the statement here. So reciprocal sign epistasis is a necessary condition for multiple, for multiple peaks. So, um, yeah, I can put, just put the picture over here. So reciprocal sign epistasis means that locally there is some, somewhere in the landscape there is a square which looks like this. Right, so this is reciprocal sign epistasis. So, you know, one of the faces of your hypercube has to have the structure. This, this is actually, once you have the idea, it's not difficult to prove, but the idea is rather subtle. So here, you know, uh, th this you can, um, you can, um, you could also look at, at the paper. So this was proved by Holweig and collaborators in a paper in Journal of Theoretical Biology. In 2011. Um, <clears throat> oh, I'm again running out of space. And uh, the third statement is about these accessible path. And so with, with regard to the accessible path, there is a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, relation to, to sign epistasis. 
So um, on a landscape without sine epistasis, um, all direct path. So a landscape without sine epistasis has only one maximum, right? So this we know. Uh, on a landscape without sine epistasis, all direct path to the maximum, to the global peak, are accessible. Are accessible. And the converse is also true. That is, if all direct paths to the global maximum are accessible, then there is no sine epistasis. Okay. So these statements. So so this this statement. Uh, so let maybe let let me give the numbers. So statement three was proved by Polbike et al. And statements one and three you can find in the paper um, by Weinreich, Watson, and Chow in Evolution 2005 which is the paper where these concepts were introduced for the first time. This is a very nice paper, and you know, if you're interested, I would recommend having a look at it. <clears throat> and you can find, of course, you can find a lot of this information also in the, in the articles that I uh, posted or had posted on the, on the course website. <clears throat> okay, so now we have, have these sort of two uh, sets of, of uh, measures of topographic features. Um, is this reasonably clear? So we have the peaks and we have these accessible paths, okay? And so now, of course, you would like to know somehow, you know, what are the properties of these measures? I mean, how much, how, how many accessible paths should you expect? I showed you some examples yesterday from empirical studies. So some landscapes are sort of more accessible than others, but one would like to get some mathematical handle on this. And so um, here, you know, what you of course want to do as a statistical physicist is to make some models where you can actually calculate these things. Okay, so that's what I want to do next. And this is very much in line with the, uh, with the philosophy that, that uh, Satya uh, presented in his first lecture about random matrix theory, if you remember, um, you know, the story about Wigner, who was confronted with these uh, enormously complicated nuclear spectra, and he said, okay, if we can't, you know, if we can't even write down the Hamiltonian, let's assume the Hamiltonian is random, right? And, and here, the um, uh, uh, philosophy is rather similar. We're, we're faced with this enormously complex mapping from genotype to fitness, and unless, you know, we have some better idea, we just replace it by a random function. So that's what we're going to do. And this is called, in this context, this model that we're going to study, this is known as the House of Cards model. <clears throat> and so what we're simply going to do is um, that we're going to assign the fitness values at random. Okay, so the idea, um, replace complexity by randomness. Which in this context means that we simply assign um, the fitness values the genotypes as independent 
and identically distributed, so IID in the jargon, random variables from some distribution. It will turn out that the distribution actually for what I'm going to talk about doesn't matter. From some, it has to be continuous. So we want it to be continuous uh, because we don't want to have um, two genotypes that have the same fitness. But it, otherwise, it's arbitrary. Is it clear why it's arbitrary? Why it doesn't really matter if I'm interested in this, in the, for example, in the properties of peaks? Uh, why, why is it ir irrelevant what, you know, if I want to know the number of peaks, why is it irrelevant what the, what the um, distribution is? Well, in fact, you're only interested in the ordering, right? That's sort of what I emphasized. Everything that we're interested in is encoded in the fitness graph. The fitness graph uh, depends on the ordering of the fitness values. So all I need to know is the ordering. So I can apply any transformation to my random variables. As long as it's monotonic, it will not change the ordering, right? So that's, and, and that's actually a kind of a, a philosophy that I think you will hear more about in Sanjib's lectures when he starts talking about records, because in record statistics, this is also an extremely important uh, uh, idea. <clears throat> okay, just a short remark on the history of this model. So in this form, it was first introduced by Stuart Kaufman and Levin in 1987. And, uh, and this was a time when in statistical physics, a lot of people were interested in spin glasses. And obviously, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, very much uh, uh, the, the, these um, <coughs> random functions on uh, the hypercube are, of course, very similar to energy landscapes of uh, disordered spin systems. And so in physics, uh, this is sort of closely related to the random energy model of spin glasses. That was introduced by Bernard Derrida a little bit earlier. Um, and so, and you can see in the papers of Kaufman that he was also quite a bit influenced by this, uh, by this idea, okay. Um, so, okay, so we want to do some computations with this model, so the first, thing that I want to calculate is the number of fitness maxima. <clears throat> so what is the probability that uh, a randomly chosen genotype is a maximum or a peak? Well, this is the probability according to the, de to the definition. This is a probability that its fitness value is larger than the fitness value of the others, right? So let me put that down here again. So this is the probability that f of tau is greater than f of tau prime for all tau prime with distance one. Now, how many such neighbors are there? L, right, so they are L, L neighbors. Um, <clears throat> and so if I uh, want to compute this, you can basically take a cue from what, um, uh, what Sanjib has, has uh, uh, taught you over the last days. So let's say the, the fitness distribution, so this is the only, I mean, at this point I'm going to introduce a fitness distribution, but also only to show you that it doesn't matter. So let's suppose the fitness distribution is the following. So the, the, the cumulative distribution, so the probability that the fitness is less or equal to x, I call q, for, q of x. I think this is a notation that Sanjeev also used. <clears throat> 
and the corresponding density is then the derivative of that, right? <clears throat> okay, so with this we can, we can write down an expression for this. And so let's suppose the um, fitness of the genotype that I'm looking at is X, okay? So let's suppose the fitness of the genotype that I'm looking at it is X. What is then the probability that all the neighbors have a smaller fitness? Remember, everything is independent. So these are IID random variables, right? So the probability that all the neighbors are, you know, the probability that one of the neighbors is smaller than X is Q to the X. So if all of them, it has to be Q to the X to the L, right? So basically, so this is sort of the probability that all the neighbors have a smaller fitness. And this I have to average over um, the fitness value, so I just have to calculate this integral, okay? The density, this is a probability that the neighbors are smaller, okay? Now at this point, I can make a variable transformation, and this is something that, you know, occurs over and over again in the theory of records. So, I, I, so basically what I want to do is to, to use P of X or to use Q of X as my new variable. So we do a variable transformation. And that's, you know, that's good. That's uh, certainly a good idea because Q is a monotonic function. So I can do, uh, you know, I just go from X to Q of X, and the integration element dQ is then simply dQ by dx dx, which is the same as P of X dx, right? And the range of Q, of course, is between 0 and 1. So what I get is simply the integral from 0 to 1 dU u to the L. Right. <clears throat> and this integral everybody can solve, so what is it? One over L plus one, exactly. Right? And you see this is manifestly independent of P, right? So this is independent of P. as it has to be because it's just a property of the uh, rank ordering. And in fact, there's, a, you know, there's an easier way of getting this, but I thought it's useful to see this explicit calculation because obviously what, if I, if I look at the, the fitness value of the peak together with its neighbors, and I'm just looking at L plus one IID random variables, and what I'm asking is the probability that one of them is bigger than all the others, right? Now, of course, if you have L plus one IID random variables, one of them has to be the biggest, but by symmetry, any one of them is, is equally likely to be the biggest, right? So the probability is one over L plus one. Okay, so this is um, uh, very simple. And so with that, we can actually immediately write down the number of peaks. <clears throat> so the expected number of peaks So we have calculated that the probability for a randomly chosen genotype to be a peak is one over L plus one. There are two to the L genotypes. So the expected number of peaks, just write as the expectation of, let me call this N max, is equal to two to the L, which is the total number of uh, sequences divided by L plus one. Okay, so that's, that's a very simple result. This was already shown by Kaufman and Levin. Um, you know, if you need more exercises, you can try to calculate the variance. Um, let me just write down the expression. 
So this is what the variance is. Um, you see that for, for a large L, this becomes approximately one half the expectation. Um, now, of course, this one over L plus one means that as L gets bigger, in some sense, there are fewer maxima, right? So the, 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 the fraction of, 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 of sequences which are maxima become smaller. So, so they become sort of dilute, and you might think that therefore the distribution should become a Poisson distribution, which would mean that the variance should be equal to the mean. This factor one half shows that this is not quite the case, and the reason is essentially that there is a constraint because you cannot have two maxima that are next to each other, right? So there's a certain amount of repulsion between the maxima, and that reduces the fluctuations in the total number. But this is just an aside. What I want to emphasize here, so I showed you yesterday this uh, debate between uh, Wright and Fisher. So, um, so, so uh, uh, Fisher was saying that in high dimensional spaces, there are essentially no peaks. And he was giving an argument based on the uh, eigenvalues of the Hessian. And here you can see that in some sense, uh, there's a kind of compromise between the two viewpoints because on the one hand it's correct as Fisher's intuition told him that as you increase L, uh, the fraction, the probability for any given point to be a maximum becomes smaller, right? This is certainly true, but it becomes smaller only in an algebraic fashion. At the same time, the total number of sequences grows exponentially and as a consequence, the number of maxima also grows essentially exponentially up to the small factor here. All right, so this sort of, in some sense, resolves um, uh, this Wright-Fisher debate that I mentioned yesterday. And this is, uh, this is true, of course, this is now the, only the very simplest model that you can cook up. One can, one can study more complicated models which have correlations in them and so on. Um, but but the, 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 the feature that generically the number of maxima grows exponentially with L, it may, may not always grow as two to the L, it may grow with a smaller rate, but it, it typically does grow exponentially with L, so this is very robust. Okay, so this is a, um, a very robust result. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so then let me um, say something about uh, the other property, so these accessible pathways. And so for the following discussion, it will be useful to, again, to introduce um, a kind of explicit fitness distribution. As I said, nothing depends on that, but just for ease of notation, I'm going to assume that the fitness values are distributed uniformly between zero and one, okay? Um, so I'll take the fitness values to be uniform in the interval 0, 1. Um, and so we want to look at the following situation. So let me draw another cube. And so I'm looking at two points which are a certain distance apart, okay? And I want to know what is, and I'm, I'm putting fitness values randomly everywhere, and I want to know what is the probability that there will be an accessible path from here to there. That's sort of the question that I'm asking. Okay, so we, we consider um, two genotypes um, let me call them tau and kappa, and they are at some distance. 
Yes? Sorry, yes? No. Well, no. I mean, okay, what I, I'm not assuming anything. I mean, you know, I'm assuming independence of fitness values, right? That, that's sort of, of course, what the model tells you. Um, but, but it turns out, so, you know, as I said, you cannot have two maxima at, at adjacent sides, right? Um, sorry? Ah, no, I mean, aha, okay, this is, yes, I mean, this is uh, something that always confuses people. Um, but, but, well, this is just a, a, a consequence of the linearity of the expectation, right? I mean, um, you know, the probability of any given site is, is to be a maximum is 1 over L plus 1. The total number of maxima is equal to 2 to the L, so the total number... Okay, so should I maybe, I, okay, let me try to do a kind of more formal argument, right? So, um, yeah, maybe that's, that's helpful. It, it, there was a time when it also confused me. So, so let me write n max as a sum. Okay, so, so I take my, my genotype space, and on each point, each, each uh, 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 genotype, I put an indicator variable which tells me whether this genotype is a maximum or not, okay? So this is a random variable and I can write it as a sum over all my genotypes of some indicator variable. Let me call this, uh, you know, sigma of tau, which has a property that sigma of tau is equal to one if tau is a max, is a peak, and zero else. Right? So this is a random variable, this is a set of random variables. Now what is the expectation of n max? Right? I mean these are all, you know, these are all, um, uh, all have the same distribution, so whatever this is, this will be the number of terms times the expectation of sigma of tau. Right, and what my computation has shown me at the, the, is that this expectation is 1 over L plus 1. Right, so this has nothing to do with whether these things are correlated or not. But it's only a property of the first moment, right? So as soon as you want to calculate the variance, you have to take into account that um, two neighboring sites cannot be maxima, and also that, that two maxima that are at distance 2 are correlated, right, because they share neighbors. And that's in fact, I mean, that's sort of, so you have to, if you want to calculate this, you have to think about how that works, right? So you, there are no correlations beyond that, but, but, but maxima at distance two are correlated. Okay? Very good. Uh, because essentially I'm going to use the same argument over here, so that's probably useful that we, we clarify this. Um, right, so we want to look at two genotypes at distance L. Um, and obviously, you know, if, if, if uh, so the, the peak goes, the, the path goes from tau to kappa, obviously as kappa has lower fitness than tau, there cannot be, be any path. So I'm also going to assume that the fitness difference between these two, so tau, f of kappa minus f of tau has to be positive, and I'm going to fix it to be some number beta, right? And so beta is some number in the interval between zero and one. So that's sort of a parameter, and obviously you expect if beta is bigger, it should be easier to find a path from um, one point to the next. Um, and I'm, for now, I'm only going to look at the direct path. So we consider only direct path. So how many direct paths are there from tau to kappa? So tau and kappa differ at L different sites. So they're L sites that I have to change either from zero to one or from one to zero. 
Sorry? No, not quite. Huh? No. L factorial, yes, I, the, I, the majority is for L factorial, and this is actually right. Yes, L factorial, right? I mean, basically, I have to, so each step changes one of the symbols, and I have to do them in any arbitrary order, and so it's L factorial. So we have L factorial path. Um, Okay, so the L factorial direct path from tau to kappa. Um, and so I'm going to proceed exactly in the same way as here. I'm going to ask what is the probability that any given path is accessible? Okay, what is the probability? Um, Uh, a given path is accessible so you know if you think about this so so let's say we have here we're sort of looking at our path right it has it of is a, it a, is a, of length l so i start here and here i have my endpoint and here i put the fitness values and they are between 0 and 1 um, and let's suppose that, um, you know, I start at zero and then I have some fitness values, you know, that are, so let me, you know, let me draw an example that is not accessible, but just to make this clear, so I have some fitness values. Um, and, and the final fitness value is, uh, the final fitness value here is beta, okay. So obviously if any of the fitness values is greater than beta, this will not be accessible. So we have, we have sort of two conditions, so let me call so let me try to write this down. So there are two conditions. The first one is that all the fitness values in between, so they are, this is my initial point, this is my final point. So in between I have L minus one fitness values. And they are all IID random variables. And they all have to be uh, less than beta, right? So the probability for this is beta to the L minus one. So this is the probability that all fitness values, so all intermediate values fitness values um, are between f of tau and f of kappa. And so I can, you know, I, I can pick uh, L minus one values that have that property, but then in addition, you know, obviously this is also not good. So even if this one wasn't here, it wouldn't be good because they are not increasing. So in, in addition, they have to be monotonically increasing. Now, what is the probability that they are monotonically increasing? <clears throat> so I give you L minus one IID random variables. What is the probability that they are monotonically increasing? It's one over L minus one factorial because again, you know, there's always a kind of argument you do for IID random variables. All possible orderings are equally likely and I want one particular one. And so the probability for that is one over L minus one factorial, right? So this is a probability. 
that they are increasing. Okay. So now I can again, uh, as, as over there, I can invoke linearity of the expectation. So I can say that the expected number of, of accessible paths of accessible direct path so the expectation of n accessible is equal to the total number of path times this and so you see if you multiply this by l factorial you then you, what you get is equal to l times beta to the l minus 1 Okay, so this is the expected number of accessible, direct accessible path as a function of the fitness difference between the initial and the final point. Um, now, of course, we're, we're sort of primarily interested in this property when L becomes very big, right? So now we, let's look at what happens if we take L to be very big. And you can see that there are sort of there are two cases. So let's first consider the case when beta is less than one. Um, so beta can be at most one, but you will see in a moment that beta less than one and beta equal to one are different. So when beta is less than one, then you see this this factor is less than one, and you take it to some high power, so it will go to zero, right? Um, so what does this mean? So, so the, the, the question that we're really interested in, I mean, ideally we would like to, to compute the distribution of this number of accessible paths. This is, you know, also something one can try to do, but it's, it's not that easy. So, but the, the, the primary um, uh, quantity that we're interested in, you know, if you, if you think about this in terms of evolutionary dynamics, you might say, what is really relevant is the question whether there is a path at all, right? I want to know whether there is some way of getting from tau to kappa, right? So what I'm interested in is what is the probability um, that there will be at least one accessible path. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what is this? This is equal to so let me maybe you know just briefly introduce also the the full distribution. So let's let's say um, the probability that we have exactly n accessible path. Let me call this uh, I don't know Q n, right? <clears throat> so um, this is equal to the the um, well. I guess I can be at most L factorial, but L is very large. Doesn't really matter. Um, n times uh, uh, qn, right? So this is a probability that, that uh, um, n is not equal to zero. And so now one can invoke something that is called the Markov's inequality. So I can multiply this by n, right? If I multiply this by n, then, you know, because n is greater or equal to one, the sum will only increase, right? So we can say this is equal to less or equal to um, n times qn, so this is called Markov's inequality. <clears throat> and this we just computed, maybe this is just the, the expected number of accessible paths. And so what you see is that if you take L to infinity, this will go to zero. And therefore, this also has to go to zero, All right? So the statement is when beta is less than when beta is less than one, the probability of finding a path, uh, a direct accessible path, is is zero. Okay. Now, what happens when beta is equal to one? Now, beta equal to one is, um, 
essentially means, you know, that's sort of the maximal value. So essentially this means that you put your initial point to be the minimal possible fitness and the final point the maximum possible fitness, right? So that basically means that you're considering path from the, from the global minimum to the global maximum. <coughs> so here we consider path from global minimum to the global maximum. <clears throat> now when beta is equal to one, you see that the expected number of paths is L, right? Then this thing disappears. And so it actually diverges when L becomes big, right? Now, if it diverges, you know, you have an inequality in this direction, but you cannot really make any use of it because this diverges, but that doesn't tell you anything about the probability on the right-hand side. So then you need to use another inequality. Um, <clears throat> and this involves a second moment. So this has various names. I'll just call it the second moment inequality. Which is that, again, for the probability of having at least one um, accessible path. So you can bound it from below by the ratio of the square of the expectation divided by the expectation of the square. All right, so this somehow tells you something about, you know, how, how concentrated the distribution is. If the, if the distribution is, is, uh, is um, <clears throat> uh, well concentrated, then this thing will essentially go to one, okay? Um, and, uh, um, <clears throat> but, but you see, in order to use it, you actually need to calculate the second moment, right? And this is much, much harder. So, so the discussion that we had previously with regard to the linearity of the mean applies to the first moment. But as soon as you want to calculate the second moment, you have to worry about, you know, if you, so you have to look at pairs of path. And they might, of course, you know, they might, they might uh, 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 overlap over some distance and then the the random variables that they see are not independent and so on. So this is much harder. And in fact, to compute the second moment is quite a, uh, or even estimate it is quite a tour de force. But in the end, this has been done. So, so um, two Swedish mathematicians uh, proved that in fact this for large, um, uh, for large L, this actually goes to one. And so, um, this also be, uh, has to converge to one. So the statement is when beta is equal to one, then you will always have at least one accessible path uh, between these two points. So there's a kind of phase transition at beta equal to one, okay? Um, And so there's a phase transition at beta equal to one. And this phase transition we have called accessibility percolation. So it's a kind of it's a kind of transition, you know. It, just like in percolation, you're interested in uh, the point where you have a connected path from one end of your lattice to the other. Here, you're interested in having a, an accessible path from one end of your system to the other, and this changes abruptly as a function of some control parameter. In this case, the the, the fitness difference between the two points. Yes. Since that these properties uh, that p of n accessible 
So it tends to zero, it depends on the measure you choose to uh, choose the precise value. So it's a bit. Uh, not really. I mean, so, so as I said, you know, for this discussion, I'm sort of assuming that the distribution is uniform. But, but if it's not uniform, you know, you just, you know, instead of taking beta, take the, the cumulative distribution of your, of your, distribu of, of your uh, uh, probability distribution, right? So then everything goes through. I mean, you know, this, this argument, you know, this calculation, of course, relies on this being uniform. But you could also interpret beta simply as being like the quantile of fitness, right? So I'm just saying if beta is 0.7, this means that my, the fitness difference is 70% of the entire range. So nothing really depends on the distribution. But you're right that, of course, if you, if you really assign fitness values completely at random, then um, you, know, you pick two points generically, they there would not be a path. But you can, of course, consider you know, you can sort of condition, right? So you can, you can deliberately say this one point is the global minimum, the other point is a global maximum, and then you will have a path between them, okay? Now this is, you know, this is not a terribly interesting phase transition because it's a bit like the Ising model in one dimension. It's sort of at, at only in one uh, limiting, uh, at one limiting uh, boundary point. Uh, but so in the last couple of minutes, let me just mention and this is discussed in, in great detail in this. Uh, uh, so there's a kind of review article on accessibility percolation that is also on the web page. Um, and so the point is that you can now, you know, all of this was for, for direct path because here this calculation is reasonably simple. But of course you could ask what happens for, uh, for indirect path, right? So if we include indirect path. Um, Um, and let me just, you know, just make some, uh, just show you one, one, you know, small feature of what that means. Um, so, uh, you know, let's suppose I want to go from this corner to that corner, right? So then a direct path would be this one, for example, right? So this would be a shorted, shortest path of length, uh, of length, um, Three, and now I, if I allow for mutation reversion, so I allow for back steps. This is also sometimes called. So then, for example, what I can do is I go here, and then I go here, and then I decide to go back. Right now, I still want to want to be able to end up at the same point. Right. So that means that I have to eventually reverse this mutation again. Right. So this is sort of this is the direct path. So this has length three. This is a path which has one reversion, right? So here I, I make one reversion, and then I continue, and then I go back once more. So you see that every reversion has to be reverted again because I still want to end up at the same place. So this is a path with one one reversion. And this then has length five, right? So you cannot have a path of length four because you want to, if you go back once, you have to compensate that later. So you can, you can, go, you can have length five. But of course, you could also do more reversions. And it turns out the maximum number in this case is that you can do two reversions. So then, um, you know, you go here, you go here, you revert. Um, then you go here, then you revert again. You go here and you go here, right? So that's sort of a, a path with two reversions. And so this has now length seven. And in fact, this is the most you can do. This is already the longest path that you can get. You can see that this is what is called a Hamiltonian path in the sense that it actually touches all the vertices, right? So, so um, these indirect paths, of course, in particular, have to be self-avoiding because you, you, know, you want to be increasing fitness. You cannot go back to the same point. So this is sort of the maximum you can do. 
And so in general, um, we see that a path um, with k reversions has length um, length um, l plus two k. Right, you, I mean, if, if, if this is, okay, so I'm assuming that this is sort of the, the, the overall distance that I want to cover is L, right? I want to go from one corner of the hypercube to the other. Um, and, and the maximum length is um, the maximum length of a path that you can have is two to the L minus one, right? So this would be a Hamiltonian path that basically covers um, uh, all the vertices. Okay, so, so if you want to solve this problem, you have to get some handle on the statistics of these reversions. Uh, you have to, um, you have to uh, estimate the number of paths um, with, uh, with different numbers of reversions, and you have to sum them, and all of this is very complicated. In particular, of course, since as, as I showed you, uh, indicated yesterday, the, the number of paths grows enormously quickly, right? So, so the total number of paths, um, I think I said something yesterday that wasn't quite right, but let me just... Um, so in principle, what we have to compute well, again, I want to compute the, the expectation of the number of accessible paths, and now I have to sum over the uh, uh, different uh, numbers of reversions. And so uh, the, the basic formula is, is still the same. If I look at any given path, the probability that it will be accessible is still of this form. So here I have, have a beta, and here I now have the length of the path, which is L plus 2K minus 1, and I'd have to divide this by L plus 2k minus 1 factorial. And then I have to multiply this by a k, which is the number of paths with k reversions. All right, so this is the number of paths with k reversions. And this is not generally known. Nevertheless, you can, you know, if, if you're clever enough, you can make some progress. And so the result is, and that's, you know, that's sort of the punchline. This was done by uh, Julien Berestitsky, Eric Brunet, and collaborators. Um, So they were able to, to analyze the sum in such a way that they could actually extract its asymptotics. And what they find is that uh, the effect of including these reversions is to sort of shift this phase transition to a finite non-trivial value of beta. And so what they showed is that um, this accessibility percolation now occurs at, um, at a non-trivial value of beta, which they call beta star, which is the logarithm of 1 plus 2 squared of 2, which is approximately 0.88. And this, so, so this only gives you, again, similar to this argument, this only gives you a bound, right? Because this is just the first moment. Calculating the second moment in this case is, uh, uh, I think, hopeless. But, but uh, with other methods, uh, uh, Anders Martinson, so the guy who proved this result, was subsequently able to show that this is actually the correct, the correct bound and, and that this is actually the exact transition point. And, and recently, uh, um, a student of mine has sort of has generalized this method to um, sequences which are not binary, so you can ask what happens if instead of using binary sequences I use a, a sequence space that has a, comes from a larger alphabet and then uh, 
you know, you still get this transition, but the, the value at which it occurs changes and so on. Okay, so that's what I wanted to uh, tell you today. So this gives us a kind of a view of how uh, many paths there are along which one can go in these uh, sequence spaces. And tomorrow I want to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, actually putting an explicit dynamics on these, on these sequence spaces. So this is, you know, this is all in some sense a static analysis. It's like a roadmap just telling you which path there are. But this, of course, doesn't mean that an actual evolutionary process, even if these paths exist, uh, an actual evolutionary process may not find them. So this is what we want to discuss tomorrow. Okay, thank you.